Welcome everybody, welcome to another episode of On The Mic with Michael Flicks. Very, very excited about this one. More excited, I've thought to respect to all my other guests, more excited for this one than I've been for others. Uh, I got Paul Rudy here. Everyone knows Paul Rudy, the creator of uh, Prep Pigskin Report. Uh, anchor, anchor for KUSI, is that? Yeah, I do. I, I work, I'm out of the sports department per se. Brandon now runs the sports show, Brandon okay. Stone, but um, I, I uh, do the PPR still, mm -hmm. and then I work the mornings on Good Morning San Diego. Okay, nice, nice. Yeah, I mean, like I said, everybody knows who you are, man. I gotta say, uh, I told a few of my other guests, I had Stephen McClure on when you were at Silver Sure, Pigeon. sure. I had him on, he's actually a family of mine, actually. Yeah. Uh, I was telling him, you're one of my, uh, like, my top three, like, San Diego interviews that I wanted, man. So this is, this is really exciting for me, for real. Well, I'm I'm honored. I'm honored, and I just what you're doing here, nothing but respect. Because I know how hard it is to launch something, mm -hmm. and when it becomes a passion project, that's no matter if it becomes monetarily successful, it is a success because you built something. Exactly. You now have a voice in the community, and anybody who could do that, I have respect for. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Because I've walked that walk, and it ain't easy, isn't it? And to all the Aaron Bergens out there, and, and everybody who's who's doing what you're doing, and mm -hmm. make it make it a niche for themselves. Got it. I love it. I love seeing it. Thank you, man. I mean, well, uh, you you, you kind of laid a blueprint for us all to kind of follow and look at, man. So you know, I sometimes say that, and I, I think a lot of people roll their eyes, but I think what we found was there was a niche in high school sports that mm -hmm. was. It was a scratch that wasn't being scratched. It was an issue that wasn't being scratched, you know? And so we found a, you cannot go wrong focusing on moms and dads' kids. Moms and dads, you know, they're just so focused on their kids mm -hmm. that if you can shine a spotlight on them, especially a positive spotlight, you, you can eat. I mean, it'll yeah. pay some bills. Yeah. And and early on, it, you know, it took a little convincing of people back in the late ninety late nineties. It took a little convincing to get management to see the light. But about that third or fourth year, when all some sponsors were starting to line up, mm -hmm. and we had an incredible run as far as just being loop. You know, it's hard to make a buck in this business, mm -hmm. and the PPR has paid its way for twenty, you know, twenty of the twenty three years it's been on the air. So, and I think a lot of people saw that and said, well, hey, that bozo can do it, why can't we? Mm -hmm. And they're right. I mean, I'm, I just, I found a way to stay 18. I just wanted to be a teenager the rest of my life. So that, you know, I wasn't, I didn't have any grand plans or grand schemes. I just, mm -hmm. this was fun to do. Okay. And so I think some other people, and now obviously technology has changed and that's also played a big role in it. But yeah, I think we've we've shown people that you know if you if you really have a real strong feeling for something, and you can scrape together the gear, mm -hmm. yeah, you can you can do it too. Mm -hmm. And and I think we're seeing tons of it now. We we used to be the lone wolf, the lone voice in prep sports. Now look, there's dozens, yeah, dozens, and there and people like yourself are doing it really really well. Thank you. And uh, if if we even had a, maybe just a little tiny part of that, well then I can I can feel good about myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, that was gonna be my my next question. You said you you had you didn't have this grand plan. The way it looks now, I would have I would have assumed that it was like, all right, I'll eventually grow it to what we're covering every every football game in the county. But I mean, as I know, because I you know I work for PPR, it started with just like a handful of people, right? Right. We we started with five guys. Three of them were wearing ankle bracelets. They couldn't be out past nine because I mean, we had such a ragtag collection of employees. Mm -hmm. All came from outside the building, and we, we got to twelve games. And, and we thought that was a big freaking deal because mm -hmm. no one was doing high school. And now we have 12, we have more than 12 games in our first segment yeah. of the PPR. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in our heyday, we were getting to 38, 40 games, 42 games. Mm -hmm. And it's now there's so many schools that it's, you can't get to every game mm -hmm. and, and do the show in an hour's time. Because mm -hmm. you need to mix the highlights in with features that you can sell to sponsors so you have to have that mixture of pre-produced stuff and then you know game highlights mm -hmm. and consequently we've reined it in now we're doing 30 32 maybe when no one's looking we'll squeeze out 35 games mm -hmm. uh but the sweet spot i think is like 28 games every friday night mm -hmm. which is still you know 28 games is 28 games you're still you know, a big deal a lot of, lot of coverage uh, uh, man i'll buy you a steak dinner if you can find another tv station in, in the united states that is turning highlights from more than 25 games on Friday night, live highlights, and putting them on their air and preempting their 11 p.m. newscast. 
I'll buy anybody out there a steak dinner at Five Minute Other Station is doing it because uh, I think he was eyes a, a, a lone wolf for that. It, it, it is. I don't. I uh, I was actually just telling that Terry who you met outside. Um, I have family and friends in LA that all play sports, and they're you know in their own respect it's a pretty big deal out yeah. there. And when they you know they see me posting prep picks before they see anything about it, they're like, man, I wish we had something like that in LA. And, and LA, you know, a lot of it it's just. It, it, I was working in LA and I got fired. And if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't have come to San Diego. And if San Diego wasn't the perfect size city for a high school football show like this, mm -hmm. uh, it wouldn't have happened. If I had owners working for owners who thought, "Hey, this is a really good idea," it wouldn't have happened. There's just, uh, you know, it's almost just karma that it all kind of came together and became a perfect storm. And I elect into it. I, I could still be working in LA, may, be making more money, but be absolutely miserable and have no one would know who I am. Mm -hmm. Now I walk around this town and people, everybody, everybody knows a high school football show. Mm -hmm. PPR has become a big deal. For sure. I was, I was actually just telling someone, I, I went to a game and I, uh, I, had my, I had my badge in my pocket. I had my badge in my pocket and I didn't have my red jacket on. And I'm walking up and going to the press box to ask about rosters or position for the camera or something like that. And he's like, I'm like are, are we sure you shouldn't be able to get up top of the press box? He's like, what, what school are you from? Like, where, what are you, what are you doing? I was like, on PPR. He's like, oh, okay, well, and then I literally, I was like, no, no problem, no problems. I literally came to, the, came to my car, put my jacket on, and walked back up. He's like, yeah, whatever, do what you want, whatever. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's, we were like the like ESPN of high school football. For sure. And, and now uh, you see all, look at all the other uh, people, you know, I'm sure you surf the, Twitter box as much as I do. Look at all the people now that are getting in on it, doing doing their own little version of it. And man, is it anything that can showcase our student athletes in a positive light? And the more, the merrier. Mm -hmm. I just think it's better for the kids. It's better for the parents. It's better for the community. I agree. Let me ask you this: because I know you love sports. You used to coach professional tennis. Actually, I know yeah. you love sports. So what was it about football that made you say no? Of all other sports, we're going to do a football show. Uh, uh, uh. Well, I think it's my own high school football experience. I was not a, a, a great athlete, but I was a real uh, field junkie. I love the X's and O's of the game and just the nuances of football. Okay. And, and I think the experiences of being, you know, I can remember we were playing Madison West back in 1978. Madison West was a big eight powerhouse in our, back in Madison, Wisconsin. They were, they, they you know, they had, they were like the Cathedral Catholic or maybe Torrey Pines of uh, Madison. And we were a small private school, like um, say, um, uh, Santa Fe Crit, maybe modern day, mm -hmm. modern day. And we were gonna, we knew we were gonna get killed. We, they had guys going to the, they were gonna be playing football for the University of Wisconsin. And I was lining up against a guy named Tim Straka, who outweighed me by 50 pounds and was gonna be playing for the Badgers. What position did you play? I was a, I was a wide receiver, but because we were so few in numbers, I also had to double up as a defensive end on uh, oh, okay. defense. And I can just remember they ran the same off tackle play with Tim Straka just, just you know, pancaking me play after play. My own mother was heckling me from the stand saying, Gah! and and they just ran the same play all the way down the field and scored. And I, I can just remember the lesson of humility, you know that uh, that you, know, you you don't you don't walk so tall. Mm -hmm. there, there's a humbling thing about football mm -hmm. that is. You know, you learn to deal with fear. You learn with, to deal with failure. You learn, there are life lessons that that sport teaches that just, you can't get anywhere else. And they're as valuable as anything I ever learned sitting in a classroom. And I would not be sitting here today, I'm convinced, without the experiences of my high school, as, as, as unacclaimed as it was, I learned a ton doing that. And I feel like that's something I don't know, that I want to share with everybody else. I think I think a lot of people out there get it, that there's something special. I, and I get it, it's a dangerous sport and it's not for everybody, and, I, and I, I'm not going to make that decision for moms and dads. Mm -hmm. But I am a proponent of the sport and what it teaches. How to deal with fear, how to deal with success, how to, uh, you know, I, I'll tell you what, same year, 1978, mm -hmm. against Marshfield Clomas, against another small school. And they had this little scat back. I can't remember what he was. Uh, tw number twenty-eight. I remember that. And he was two steps faster. And they kept doing this toss play, toss play in the hand. And the kid just simply was faster than I was. Just 
and kept beating me to the sideline. And uh, again, the same, the embarrassment of all. And I had tears streaming down my eyes again. And I said, okay, I know what play's coming. And uh, uh, I, I am going to go to where I think the ball's going to be, where he's going to be. And I anticipated the snap like I have never anticipated the snap before. And I caught that kid, and I hit. I have never hit anybody as hard as I hit that guy. I could feel the air rushing out of him as the ball squirted free. And uh, my, that 12 seconds, mm -hmm. it was a, maybe 12 seconds of my life. I am now 60 years of age. I think about that 12 seconds every day of my life. It was the greatest athletic moment of my life. Mm -hmm. And I think it's little things like that. that would make high school athletic specialists. You have those moments in time because we are only good looking and fast for a very short period of our lifetime, you know. And uh, and I just remember you know, that was that was as big a league play as I ever made. It was one play, and it has stayed with me for now what going on forty two years. Nice. <laughs> so that's that's what high school athletics is to me, and that's why I, I I've devoted now a third of my life. Working on the show. Mm, nice, nice. So you've wor you've worked in. A, let me back up a little bit. I was going to say you've worked in a few different places. How did you get your start in? in I was a tennis school? instructor in nice. Madison, okay. and I was going to be. I that was going to be my thing. I was going to try to get my own club because, oddly enough, I was kind. I was not a great player per se. I was okay. Mm -hmm. I could hit the ball. It was probably my best sport. But uh, the thing I was good at connecting with kids. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, they, they stuck me, the, 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 the owner of the club said, hey, I want you to t teach the top program. There were six kids in it, and mostly it was like nursery school. You know, you know, well, by the end of the summer, that six kid program, had, you know, I'd grown it into 60. And then the next year, it was 120. So then he moved me up the ladder, and next thing you know, I'm working 10, 12 hours a day on the tennis court, six days a week. I, I was rolling, and I mean, back then it was, yeah, hell, it's probably good money today, you know? And I thought this was going to be my life. And my dad sat me down, probably the best thing he ever did for me. And my dad never, was a real quiet man, and didn't have a lot to say, but when he did talk, he kind of listened. And he said, son, I want you to find a job where you wear long pants to work. So I shared that, that two hours later, I'm teaching uh, the news director at WKOW in Madison, Wisconsin. I said to him, hey, uh, my dad's looking for me to find long pants to work. And he goes, well, we have a job in, uh, in our, our camera department, photography department. Are you interested? And I said, well, lying through my teeth, I said, interested? It's my second passion. <laughs> I went to the competing station, paid a guy $100 to walk me through how to hook up the camera. Back then, you had a deck and a camera and a umbilical mm -hmm. cord. Mm -hmm. And he taught me the jargon about the Nick got me 160 and, you know, taught me a few things to say. And I bluffed my way through. A job interview and got hired as a weekend photographer. First assignment they sent me out to is a barn fire and it's a chilly night in Barnaville. And I went rushing out there and, and remembering all the things this guy paid $100 for wide shot, tight shot, tight shot of the farmer's daughter, mm -hmm. the, the cattle on the ground, blah, 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 the flame, look at the blah, blah. And it was going to be the lead story that weekend night, and I drove back. This is at unit thirteen thirty. I got, I got everything. The two cows lost. Blah blah blah. And you could just hear the panic and excitement. We came racing in. They said, "No time to edit. Just put it in. We're gonna run it raw." Oh, wow. And I forgot the white balance, so everything was blue. Oh. And completely butchered the story. They demoted me to sports the next weekend, mm -hmm. and thirty-five years later, I was still working as Great sports. Stay. Yeah. Great stay. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, before and before it was all over, I was actually, I, I, you know. I love shooting. I, I think that's a whole. Mm -hmm. Anybody who's ever worked a camera knows it's a, it's an art form all to itself. Absolutely. And then you get to combine the art form of writing, mm -hmm. presenting, mm -hmm. shooting. Man, if you're if you're an artist, absolutely. Th this is not a bad profession. Absolutely. You know, because I was terrible in school. I don't know. I, 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 was, I wasn't the best either. I was actually just telling my mother-in-law. I think I was not. I, I, I think I might have had ADHD all around that man. Because if it wasn't something that was like like English, like poetry or something like that, that I was into, like writing, like you say, or something that like creative, I could use my hands. I, I, I had a real hard time focusing. Yeah. And all growing up, I just figured I just didn't like school or I just wasn't interested. But even, even in college, like I had to sit in the front row in the middle seat and like make sure I was like, if it wasn't creative, like I couldn't. Would you want to go back to school now? I would. I, I think I would be such a better student now 
because my curiosity in, about learning things mm -hmm. and learning them, I, I would love to go back. I think that's a mistake we make with uh, sending kids off to college right away. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it takes a year or two or three before they figure out what their interests are. I agree. And, but I agree. we put such pressure on kids to make their mm -hmm. career decisions when they have this much life experience. Mm -hmm. And lots of times they're doing things because mommy and daddy tell them to, or yep. where that's just, you know, they fell into it. Mm -hmm. Or because their friends wouldn't do it. Yeah. When I was in high school, unless it was like a kid that, like, he knew he knew his plan, he knew what he was going into, I would be hesitant because, you know, I'm not a parent. You can't tell kids what right. to do, especially when their parents are. But I would tell them, like, you, take a year off, man. Just take a year off and yeah. live a little bit. Like, figure out what you want to do. Don't just go rush into school because then you probably end up like I was doing ditching class and not focusing. Yeah, I, I would say to anybody out there, you really don't have to have your career path chosen until you're 30, you know, by 30 you should be able to figure out what you want to do. Mm -hmm. You should be moving in the direction of what you want to do. I agree. But, you know, I think to me, you know, everyone talks about uh, how, how the, um, how drugs are such a dangerous thing in our society, and I, Lord knows I, I don't mean to poo poo it, but to me one of the most dangerous things in society is a, is a well paying, is a good paying job you don't love because you get locked into something that you weren't supposed to do, but mm -hmm. you're doing it because you, you do it for the money. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, and then you, you, you just become a resentful, bitter human being. I agree. Before, before you're 40, because you're, you can't get out. Mm -hmm. you're, you're trapped by mm -hmm. the, you're, you know, the trappings of life. And it's even worse than those, for, with all due respect, it's even worse than those people are teachers, that they end up doing that, and they're like, end up oh. years down the road not liking it, and they're stuck doing it, and now they're... And, then, and they're poisoning every exactly. mind that they, they encounter. Mm -hmm. Don't get me started on that. I, I gotta... Let's, let's try to keep this up, because I'm a little, I'm a little, I'm a little down on uh, mm -hmm. teachers right now. Okay. Some, uh, some unions. I hate you. I hate you. So we'll, we'll, we'll leave that on there. Yeah. So with... Uh, with 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 COVID and, and everything going on, how was the? I mean, for a long time we didn't even know if there was going to be a football season. Yeah. So what was the like the the, the stress or the hassles of pulling PPR together this season? Well, I mean, the the six week spring fling we just did was was easy because it was felt we were doing it very short staff, mm -hmm. and uh, but we weren't doing as many games and and it didn't without the kids in the stands and without the bands on the field it felt like a long exhibition season. Mm -hmm. So consequently, there was something missing. It's just like when you have a souffle and there's one ingredient missing. You can't figure out which one it is, but mm -hmm. there's something missing. Mm -hmm. uh, the interesting one, I thought, and the one I was most proud of, was the fall when we had no games and mm -hmm. we put 13 episodes on. Mm -hmm. And I thought we, you know, God bless Brandon Stone and, and the people I work with because, man, they're, they're just hard-charging, hard-working, creative cats. And they all came up with an idea, this, that, and the other thing. We did a lot of Zoom. You know, we, we had guests that we would never, you know, we had Tony Mandridge, if you're a former NFL lineman. We had lots of NFL, uh, you know, Louis Riddick from Monday Night Football. We had big name people that we would never have yeah. because because you would never be able to get them in the studio, or right? Whatever, you know, because we do everything in the studio. So uh, on that scorecard, I, I, I was most proud of what we did without football, that we kept you know, the fire burning in the, you know, the light burning in the window. Mm -hmm. And so be, now we're going to start off again in fall and hopefully we're going to be working together and, and doing our show like we used to do. When all is said and done, we'll have done 35 PPR, 35 hours of PPR, 35 hours of PPR in one calendar year. Wow. Which is nothing to sneeze at. I mean, that, uh, I mean that's that's a lot of TV. You know, mm -hmm. And, I, you know, I don't know. God bless everybody who out there who is watching it, mm -hmm. because I know there's a thousand different things to do, and I know we're out of season, and I know mm -hmm. without high school football there's maybe no reason to watch. But God bless you for, uh, and God bless the sponsors who stepped up. You know, sight unseen, they just took the leap of faith with us. You know, the Elkhorn Fords, because we're out here in Elkhorn, I want to at least say that. I'm mean, uh, Elkhorn Boerfart, I have to say, Poldak and Elkhorn Ford, and they just they write the checks. You know, probably it doesn't do them any good to do it because they, our numbers are softer when, when it's not the fall and, mm -hmm. and they're probably not getting the bang for their buck, but they do it because they want to do it because they're, they're doing it for the kids. Mm -hmm. They feel like it's important for the kids. And I, So like when the next time you're buying a truck out there, check out Alcon Ford or National Sea Mile Cars or if you're next time you're buying some milk, Hollandia Dairy or if you're going to go uh, rent an RV, haul an RV. Mozzie hey, <laughs> heating air and solar for all your uh, <laughs> your, your heating air needs. Uh, 
and thank you for all those folks who uh, stepped up. Absolutely. What do you uh, What do you kind of see next, or what, do you have any like future plans for PPR? Or you kind of just yeah. I think we're going to take advantage of this technology. I mean, the Zoom thing. People, are, you know, I, back in the day, we all, you know, we all in the TV industry, we just looked down our nose at Zoom interviews because the quality wasn't there, and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. well, that all changed really real quick in the blink of an eye. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to keep. You know, I still I still like bringing kids into the studio because I like getting to meet the kids and, mm -hmm. and I like to watch them as they look at the environment and mm -hmm. you know for a lot of them it's for some never been in a TV studio mm -hmm. and it's exciting and, it's and they're exciting. on live TV mm -hmm. and, and it, you can always tell the stud kids because they they rise to the occasion be it on the field or mm -hmm. be it in, on, mm -hmm. in a TV studio and so I still want to do that part of it but as far as keeping the big names and maybe keeping track of the you, know, you bring up stuff from McClure and the people that might not otherwise be available to us at that hour of the night, mm -hmm. but well, they certainly would never drive into the studio at that hour of night. They might do something with us mm -hmm. from, uh, via Zoom. So I think that's the thing you're going to see, and I think we're really going to. Well, oh, by the way, we are already uh, hiring for the fall. We're looking for the next generation of uh, field producers out there. So if you're a photographer, field producer, or have any kind of social media expertise, you know, we, it's an entry level wage, but you still get paid. And it's a lot of fun. And yeah, it's fun, and more than anything, it's an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I mean, look at our sports department. Nick Polino started as a field producer. Allison Edmonds, full-time worker, started as a field producer. Joaquin Duncan, full-time sports photographer. Oh, maybe the only one in San Diego is the only photographer that just does sports. Brandon Stone started as a field producer. Nick Polino started as a field producer. Nick James started as a field producer. Everybody, we have five five or six full-time people that all started through the PPR. And that's just our station. Go around through mm -hmm. all the other stations in the market, and just about every photographer working out there right now once wore the red jacket. Mm -hmm. So it's a great way, if you're serious about your broadcast career, we trade you entry-level wages, we trade experience for, for you working for actual level of wages, and then you have to put up with me yelling at you, but mm -hmm. how bad is that? I mean, how bad it always happened to me a few times, yeah. how bad? You learn from it, you don't make that mistake again, you keep pushing forward. You know, I always feel bad about that. I'm a, I'm a product of how I was taught, mm -hmm. raised, and educated, and I get yelled at a lot. So mm -hmm. consequently, that's how I tend to communicate. Mm -hmm. And I, I I swear to God, I, you know, I, I come from an Italian background, very loud family, and we get, just, we get in each other's grill, and then it's gone, it's mm -hmm. over. Mm -hmm. and then, uh, that's exactly how you operate. Yeah. That's exactly how you operate. I, tell, I was telling my, I told my brother the story, I think my second, my second time, it might have been my first time in the studio actually. I finished up my stuff early because I wanted to sit like behind the scenes and just watch how you guys do the show. So I got all my stuff done, everything submitted, everything's good. And uh, I forget, someone, a uh, uh, top dog, he walked back there and asked, he was like, does anybody want to help take notes for the show? I'm like, yeah, I'll do it, I'll do it. And I come over there, he's like, yeah, sit right here, whatever I, whatever I yell out, write it down. I'm like, okay, cool. Go to commercial, and you didn't even really look at me. You just yelled it out. And I'm just like trying to take everything in. You're like, no, write that down. I was like, oh, okay, okay, okay. And he kind of like, gave me a look like <laughs> All right, bro, stay on the ball. And I'm going to try to that. Because that's, I believe in instant feedback. It, and it's like, coaching is only good if it's, you know, it's just like, we, you know, uh, training a dog. Mm -hmm. The dog doesn't understand it 20 minutes later. If you made it, you have to be right there and right on it. Mm -hmm. And I try to make it loud because I like this one stress test kids. Mm -hmm. Because I want to, you know, this our whole business is about deadlines. Mm -hmm. And I want to see who's going to crack and who's not going to crack because you know the ones that can handle a little yelling, they get the bigger games, mm -hmm. or they get the more important assignments because I know that they're less likely to fade mm -hmm. than somebody who almost had, you know. And I and there's been a couple times where, for kids, just are not used to, you know, I'm I'm a dinosaur as far as. You know, all my human uh, human resources nightmares. I remember a kid called me on the carpet because I called him numb nuts. I said, "Numb nuts, get over here!" And I, and I just thought, oh, you know, how many more years? I probably only have a couple years left because if numb nuts is going to get me in trouble, right, right. Yeah, I'm, I'm, that, I'm assuming that person didn't stick around there. No, they 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 faded. But mm -hmm. you know what? Like I said, this is not for everybody. It's you, not. You're, but if you want to get a taste of it mm -hmm. without with very little personal investment, I mean, you just kind of come and work a Friday night. That, that, you get paid, so you're going to be compensated. Hey, come check it out. Mm -hmm. 
more more people love it than don't. Absolutely. And, and one thing I'll say, and I was gonna say once people get to know you, but it's not even a thing of getting to know you. Once people just like see you in your not even in your element, just see you interacting with people, they it, I think it's fairly easy for someone to understand that that moment was just that moment, and that's not how you you know. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, here's the thing. Here's the I actually love them all, mm -hmm. and the thing that gives me the biggest thrill now is not a show at a high rating or not. I still get excited about landing a big sponsor, mind you. Mm -hmm. that, that's always fun. For sure. Because, I mean, I, I had a 2.3 grade point average. I would, I, Likewise. You know, I, would, I, would, I, I, I mean, I graduated 157 out of 163. So I, I was not gifted. And I always think myself, you know, because I'm a bumpkin from, you know, rural Wisconsin, that, hey, I just was sitting across from some, you know, Yale educated person, mm -hmm. he signed a check for a show, and I said, ah. <laughs> But the thing that gives me the biggest thrill now is getting other people started in the business. Because, you know, I, I, didn't, get, I didn't get that. I, I had a scratch and claw for every little opportunity I got. I worked mm -hmm. every freaking holiday just to, so I could anchor one show, and then I worked every freaking holiday to anchor the second show. Mm -hmm. And I mean, and I got abused by wages, and you know, I had to work two full-time jobs. I worked a tennis job and a TV job just so I could do the, they so underpaid me, they thought they could run me off and, mm -hmm. and I just stuck with it. And, and you know, it's just one of those things where it, to be good at this, all you need is reps. Anyone can do it. If I can do it, anyone can do it. You just need reps. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of them, a lot of them, because in the TV business, it's all about correct, it's about learning how to deal with mistakes because mm -hmm. everything goes wrong eventually. And the first time you usually, you mess up so badly and then you can't get, you overreact, overreact, and you make it the situation worse and then you start to sweat and everybody's uncomfortable. And, but by the third time that mistake happens, you learn how to handle it. And then you learn how, to, there's a finite number of things that can go wrong in TV. Mm -hmm. And after you've been around the block about five or six years, nothing scares you anymore because anything that's ever gone bad has gone bad mm -hmm. and you know how to handle it. Mm -hmm. And you know how to be, you, you, you like the one thing I always tell people, when things start to go south, slow down and just relax and smile and be honest with people and say, hey, here's the issue, we're having a video, we're gonna get to it, bear with us. And and just kind of, because mm -hmm. because your normal reaction is for your sphincter to get really tight and you, and you start talking really fast and your voice goes like, and then it makes everybody uncomfortable. But if you're comfortable, the viewer's comfortable. Mm -hmm. And that's the uh, thing that experience teaches with, uh, and, then, and, then, and that's what we're teaching these kids. When they come in, here's how you handle it, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And when they get a gig somewhere, and when I get a note from them saying, when they get their second gig, we have a gal that worked on our show for a little while, and now she is a reporter in Houston. I remember telling her that if you don't get your shit together, you're not gonna make it in this business. And then sure enough, she, boom, she went from one big place to the next, and now she's in Houston, which is a top 10 market. Her career is gonna is gonna surpass mine by light years, and she wore the red jacket one time. Mm -hmm. And when it, it's those stories, mm -hmm. you know. If uh, when uh, when you put me in the ground, I just hope it's those stories that get told, mm -hmm. as opposed to the ones that when I yelled at them in the studio. I'm sure they will. I'm mm -hmm. sure they will. I don't think you have anything to worry about. Um, Speaking of help, helping kids, as you say, helping the kids, as you say, I know, I, I forget exactly what it's called, but I know PPR has a thing where like you let, you let the kids come in and, and cover games or... Pigskin Idol. Idol. There you go, Pigskin Idol. You, you know, everyone talks about how, if you look at the PPR, mm -hmm. it resembles my high school career and that everything is stolen. Uh, <laughs> every idea, Pigskin Idol is a, just a complete ripoff of American Idol. Mm -hmm. That was popular and, and you know, everything, like when, when I was growing up, the sportscaster everybody wanted to be was Chris Berman. So um, all my stuff is a you know rip off of him. And that's what I tell people: Hey, steal from the people that you like, and steal their ideas. And PPR has become a, such a collection of stolen ideas, and you stir it all together, mm -hmm. and what comes out is oddly unique. Yep. Yep. And, but it, it's nothing more than a collection of stolen ideas. And, yeah. I mean, and I, speaking of kids stepping up, they're 18 year old kids, 17 year old kids coming into the studio, never been in a studio before, narrating highlights, often of their school on the air. Think about what a freaking big time moment that is <laughs> and what a college uh, uh, entry resume item that is. You could say, hey, I've already, 
right. want to be I want to be a journalist, and I've already had this and put that on your your your, you know, your college entrance papers. Yeah, it's that. Yeah. So uh, and uh, and how good they are. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not scary. easy because it's not easy. I remember my first yeah my first show. You would have thought I would have been uh, I was on a map. My eyes were like. I was like this. I was shaking. Mm -hmm. I can remember it was night. It was 1984, and the Bears were playing a game in England. I think a summer exhibition game. I willing to. I got to that state because it was my first time angry, and I got there at like eight o'clock in the morning, and I shot until noon. Got all sorts of local 5K races, and then all I had was a 10 o'clock sportscast and from noon until six. I edited everything. I, you know put everything together, checked every frame, and then from 6 until 9.30, I practiced my script so many times that I could have done it without, without a teleprompter. And I remember it was a hot summer day and I was wearing, I wore shorts on the air because all oh, people only see you up and my dad was going to watch my first sports cast. And I remember leaning back in my chair and I just crossed my leg because I got through it and I was so, so proud. And the news anchor who was sitting to my left looked down and all you could see was this hairy piece of flesh. You couldn't really tell what part of the body it was, but it looked pretty obscene. It just kind of... <laughs> and I remember my dad called me and said, son, don't come home. Because <laughs> <laughs> I still was wearing shorts to wear. Oh, but, but that was my first night of the year, 1980, yeah. summer 84. Nice. Yeah. Nice. It was a hook, man. And so I'm glad I, I didn't expect it. I'm so glad I'm getting all these stories. <laughs> have you have have you been interviewed in like in San Diego? Uh, a couple, you know, a, a few times. Uh, mm -hmm. Periodically, mm -hmm. uh, we we had a big write, a couple bigger write ups in the paper. Mm -hmm. But I mean, these are stories people that worked with me a long time have heard, mm -hmm. heard mm -hmm. over and over again. But they're, they're my stories. Right? right. I love it. Yeah. I love it. That's what that, that's that's what my show is, man. I'm here to. If, if there's something to promote, yeah, we'll promote it. But I'm here to, to hear the stories and to get, you know get the, get the full spectrum, you know. Uh, I um, you know the, I, to me, the uh, the moment, my favorite PPR story. Can I just tell one? Absolutely. Thing? My dad was uh, a big high school football star for Kenosha, Wisconsin. He played with a guy named Alan Amici, who went on to become an NFL Hall of Famer, one of the biggest names to ever play at the University of Wisconsin. And, and they were in the same backfield. And my dad used to love to tell the story about how, well, the reason why Alan Amici got all the yards is because everybody was keen on him. But they played his junior and senior year, they played 16 games. The average margin of victory was 35 points. They, no one could touch them. They were the they, they, they are still considered the greatest high school football team in, in, uh, wow. in Wisconsin. And my dad, when he, he was a busy man, but when he would come home, he'd gather all the kids in, in, the, in the schoolyard together, and we and we would run his favorite play, the 46 crossfire. And he taught us all 11 kids. We'd have 11 kids, and and he taught us. It was this, it was this crazy misdirection play. Mm -hmm. And so I always have remembered. I he, when when he passed away. He, uh, he left me his card as well, and, and I put license plates for his across there. So, uh, long story short, I was Santana High School. I was going to uh, cover their auction, and one of the auction items was you get to call the play, or you get to draw the play. And uh, some lady won the auction item, and I said, oh, uh, number 62, you've got the play. She comes up to me, she goes, I don't know what to do with it. Uh, I'm the coach's... Uh, I'm the coach's mother. Would you do it for me? Oh, nice. And I and I thought, oh, what play would I? I went out to practice and I was grabbing everybody by the face mask, and I uh, I taught them the forty six crossfire. You know, it's, it's a full high you know, back like in the old fifties yeah. football, three running backs, shoulder to the you know, you know, completely completely outdated. But they learned the forty six crossfire, and they were going to run it two weeks later in their next game. And I called my dad. And I said, Pop. You're going to, uh, you're going to love this. Mm -hmm. I, I taught the Sultans the 46 crossfire. I'll call you. They're going to run it tonight on the PPR. So this is the RCR formation, okay? That's a tribute to the old man. The 46 crossfire is going to go like this. Two weeks after that coaching session, the Cougars welcomed Santana to Steel Canyon. Coach Bemke's offensive coordinator, Haran Hutchinson. 
sending in the play. I think it's time to run 46 crossfire. Definitely think it's time to run 46 crossfire. Hey, look, let's run 46 crossfire out of the right hand for boys. RCR 46 crossfire, short yardage. Let's go score. It wasn't like a Steel Canyon play. It was just a, a random fancy play. So, you know, that was pretty awesome. And sure enough, the guy at the kid scores of a, a mag, and then they scored again. They ran it twice and scored both times from 20 and 60 yards out. I remember calling my dad at 1 o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. Wisconsin time, and I said, Pop, they scored, they scored. Mm -hmm. and, and he squealed like a little girl. Well, it was a great father son moment. Mm -hmm. My dad died three months later during the, uh, at the end of the season, 2010. He passed away. And I had to go home and clean out his office. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things was wrap up his computer. And I went and I thought, you yeah, know, let's see. And I went onto his computer and did his search history. He had watched, because I sent him the story of the 46 crossfire. He must, he must have watched that story a thousand times. Because mm -hmm. it was just, that, that man, that, that just wiped me out. Like, sure. you know, yes. yeah. So, um, I was, to me, that 46 crossfire, because it became a big thing on the PPR and it became a big thing with me, my dad, and uh, mm -hmm. I, you can tell I still get emotional. Mm -hmm. I love it. Yeah. I love it. So, love it. you should, this is just a random idea that I just thought, you should like make that, I don't know, maybe that might be kind of, I don't know, make that like a segment on PPR and call it 46 crossfire, maybe like once a, every 14th or whatever week you go out and teach a play to a because I mean obviously like you said you're great at connecting with the kids you said you, you love that yeah but nowadays now it's especially with you know it's so competitive out there that they want they don't want to mess around right, you, yeah. you know right. now it's it's a whole different kettle of fish mm -hmm. it's gotten you know the uh, high school football it's changed and I don't know necessarily for the better and now in 2021 it's mm -hmm. you know it's got a lot of issues well, we have a lot of issues in society right now, you know, it's it just, it, it's the, uh, I don't know, I, I, I just don't think there's going to be that kind of access to it. Thank you, thank you. Like I said, it's just a random flow yeah. idea. I'm glad, I'm glad I got you here, man. Like I said, this is a, this is one thing checked off my list, man. Well, I appreciate you, you know, because I, I told you we were up to my, our yin-yang and trying to get the, the show together, and then I said I'd do it. Mm -hmm. This is, I was... 15 minute drive is no big deal. Mm -hmm. Plus, I want to make sure you come back for uh, the fall. I'm coming back every, every chance I get, I'll be back. Okay. As long as you guys want me, I'll be there. Oh, right, absolutely. And keep your eyes up because we need shooters and we need field producers and uh, we need field producers that are that are gonna that you know that PPR raw thing that we do mm -hmm. where we put compiled. Man, that thing is like burning up. That's that's people are actually going to see the every play of their game because now we're including every play of the oh, game. Okay, nice. And uh, and uh, we had like I don't know that YouTube thing is starting to catch on. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Oh, yeah, I'll be back. I'll be back. I've contributed to that raw a few times. Oh, yeah, times cool. actually. I'm proud to say that. But I mean, I, I appreciate you coming and joining me, man. This it, it means a lot. You have no idea. I w it, we didn't talk about anything we said we we're going to talk about. But so uh, let's uh, do it again sometime. For sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I will always uh, reach out. You can always reach out to me. For sure. I, Speaking of that, I felt like I was annoying you a little bit because I reached out a, a while back. You know what I mean? I felt like I was, no, I was no. like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna keep trying until it feels like I'm, I'm doing too much. <laughs> Absolutely not. And uh, I love talking about the show. As you can tell, I love the show. Mm -hmm. and, and here's the thing: is I'm now 60. So how many? Is this my last year? Is next year gonna be my last? I mean, I'm. I'm mm -hmm. Let's. The destination is a lot closer than the departure place. Got you. And how? So I'm trying to. I have decided, as, as it relates to the show, we are no longer going to get involved in the politics of the day. From this point forward, we are focusing on everything that's positive in high school sports and the other issues where we're going to leave to other people to decide the societal issues that are going on. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, after a short foray and trying to talk about the issues of the day, and yeah, mm -hmm. I'm sure you have, we're just not going to do that anymore. We're, if it's positive, it's going to be in the show. If it's not positive or if it's controversial, we're just going to steer around it and let other people handle it. And that's just that's going to be the um, mission statement going forward. I like that. Focus on the sports and on the kids. Yeah. Not mad at that at all. Like we said, thanks again for joining me. It's been another episode of On the Mic with Michael Flicks. I appreciate you guys for tapping in. I'll be back next week. Thank you.